Um, hi, everyone. Um, hello. Uh, my name's Chris Thorpe. It's, um, it's really nice of you to be here, wherever you are. Um, I can't see you, but, um, but I'm hoping you can see and hear me. Uh, it's a real privilege to be here as one of the uh, the Claude uh, sessions um, hosted by uh, Besna and HowlRound um, and share some uh, some new work and some old work. Um, I would encourage you, if you're watching this for the first time, um, I watched quite a lot of the first season of this and this is now the second season and there are some uh, there are some great artists coming up who I can't wait to see. Um, so please do check out um, the rest of the program that's available. <clears throat> so for the next, I think it's going to be about 45 minutes. Hopefully I've got my timing right. Um, I'm going to share five pieces of work with you and I'll briefly introduce them all. Uh, and then there'll be a short break after that. And then uh, Namisha Patel and uh, Tanuja Amarasuriya are going to join us, uh, hosted by Nico Vakari from Bersna, for a discussion that can range across uh, whatever you like. Feel free to ask questions. It doesn't have to be about the work that you've heard. Uh, and um, I guess I'll just get on with it. It's nice to be here. So the first thing that I'm going to read... <clears throat> is uh, a brand new piece that's uh, never been read in public in any form before. And it's one of three extracts um, of the five that are taken from my uh, new show for the Royal Court, which is the Methuen and Royal Court Climate Commission. So it's a show that I've been commissioned to write, um, hopefully for production fairly soon. We'll, we'll have to see, because obviously the world's a bit screwy at the moment. Uh, and the show is called Always Maybe the Last Time. Um, it's got a variety of ways of addressing the audience in it, um, which we'll go into as I go through, but um, this is the opening. Can I have a sip of water, please? Got to hydrate, haven't you? You know, in our crazy world. <clears throat> I had this dream. Bear with me. I know nothing's worse than someone telling you about a dream. Apart from something like this, that starts with someone pretending to tell you about a dream that they just invented. Because you immediately start, don't you, by thinking, well, that's a fucking cheat, isn't it? That's a bit fucking lazy. Trying to get away with just you know, saying the thing, the point of the thing, without inviting us all into a world that we can at least make an attempt to believe in. You know, it's a denial of reality right at the start. Leading off by saying, oh, this is not only made up, it's not even made up in good faith. You know, I can say what I want because I've already said this is a dream. So not only do the rules of logic of one thing following another not apply, it's also going to be constructed to mean something. It's going to tell us why we're all here without doing us the courtesy of pretending that we're not. It is entirely avoiding the idea of structural craft. Hold your horses, though. It's just a dream. It's honestly just a dream. So here it is the dream that I am pretending to have had. In the dream, there's this polar bear. <laughs> I'm just fucking kidding. Relax. That would be great, I wouldn't it? So, in the dream, there's this polar bear and it's made out of graphs, like a million graphs, jagged lines in red and blue and red, mainly red. And the polar bear, it's on fire. <laughs> Seriously, though, I'm just I'm just fucking kidding. And this polar bear is on fire and it's walking through a wooden school building 
and it's making the building on fire. And so the kids in the building, it's making them on fire too. And all the kids are screaming and the teachers are looking at each other like, well, that's weird. Have you ever seen this polar bear before? And occasionally the teachers, they're bending down to light their fags off a passing child's hair. And outside the school, in the dream, life's just going on as normal. Except it isn't because in everyone's faces, there's this look of suppressed panic, uh, distracted thousand yard stare sort of thing, like their minds are somewhere else. Like they know about the polar bear that's on fire and the kids that are on fire and the teachers who don't seem like they give a fuck. And it's all happening kind of within their sight. It's there on the edge of town. And also, most importantly, it's in earshot. And they're probably wondering about a council meeting they remember where a guy from the local lumber yard convinced them, although they can't remember how, that kids learn better in schools that are made out of wood, which can't have been right. But basically, people are just posting letters and ordering wallpaper and measuring shit and writing down important numbers. And maybe they're also wondering where that polar bear came from, because polar bears aren't native to wherever this is in the dream. I mean, maybe there's a really bad zoo in in the next town over. Maybe maybe they're thinking that the idiots who run the zoo in the next time, uh, town over seem like the kind of people who couldn't keep a polar bear secure, never mind not set it on fire. And, you know, but in general, people people don't really seem to care about what's going on in the school. Even though they're their kids, man. They're their actual kids. I don't know. I don't know. It's it's almost like my dream's trying to tell me something. But what? So in the dream, in the school, by now, uh, the kids are all pretty much on fire. I mean, there's a couple of lucky ones. Maybe they're hiding in a supply cupboard. Uh, maybe the school's got a swimming pool. Uh, but mainly the kids are all on fire. Um, the refugee kids went on fire first. Maybe refugees have petrol for blood or something. Basically, all the kids who were from somewhere else, uh, they went first. But, you know, all that's kind of academic uh, now, no pun intended, because apart from a couple of kids who've managed to get into the swimming pool or the supply cupboard, probably two white kids. I mean, not like the only two white kids, obviously. Most of those are on fire as well by this point. But apart from these two kids, who will be on fire soon anyway, all the kids are on fire. The little fuckers aren't dying, though. Bless them. They're just running around. They're screaming. They're maybe bubbling a bit. The, the poor ones, the ones who have clothes made like of man-made fibres, uh, they're maybe bubbling a, a little bit more. So the school starts to collapse now in the dream. Uh, the kids, they're all running out into the street. They're waving their little arms. They're, they're running down the street. And people are starting to take notice now, I guess, because it's, it's getting hard to ignore, you know. There are kids on fire in the post office and all the front gardens, like a flock of fucking demented starlings. Uh, all the money's on fire in the Bureau de Change, even the pounds and all the television licenses and the packages in the post office waiting to be collected, even the ones in the Amazon lockers outside. You know, the kids are properly bumping into people's cars. Uh, and one of them, a little girl, even manages to get as far as the 24-hour garage. Now, that is dangerous, obviously, on account of all the, the flammable liquid that's stored there. And the people who work there in the garage, they kind of half-heartedly pour sand onto the little girl out of the fire bucket but it doesn't do much good and and then the whole thing just goes up in a fireball and and the kids the kids are all screaming like help us help us but most people are still just well a lot of them are on fire too by now most of them are just wandering around and there's fucking half melted pot noodles from the garage scattered all over the town and then the dream uh the dream I'm telling you about ends. I mean, it's, it's one of those dreams that, that seems to have gone on a bit too long, like maybe one or two minutes too long. But eventually, uh, one of the adults, who's by now pretty much consumed by fire, even though they don't 
really seem aware of it, turns to another one and says, uh, was that us? You know, the thing with the, the polar bear being on fire. Did we do that? And then the dream ends. Anyway, it's not that. <clears throat> That's not even the dream I'm pretending to have had. It would be great, though, wouldn't it? If that was actually how this started. If I thought that telling you that story was going to change your mind. That would be fucking hilarious. So that was the uh, the opening of <clears throat> Always Maybe the Last Time, um, which, like I said, is the, the new Climate Commission for the Royal Court, uh, or maybe was the new Climate Commission for the Royal Court, because um, uh, maybe someone from the Royal Court's watching this right now and thinking, no way you're doing that in my fucking theory, mate, but we'll see. Um, this is the second extract from uh, Always Maybe the Last Time. Um, it's a very different voice from the first extract, which was the one about the polar bears and all the kids being on fire. Um, I've imagined that this uh, show is performed in many different ways by a, a large group of people. Um, so I guess that first extract was, I imagine it has been in a voice that could be very much like mine. This one, uh, I, I don't know, but it, it probably won't be me doing it. <clears throat> This morning, I said goodbye to my kid as she left to go to school. It was the last time I will do that. I took the bus to work. I boiled a kettle in the break room to make tea, and it was the last time I will do that. I checked my emails on my phone, and it was the last time I will do that. I sat in a bar and watch the woman at the same table order and eat some sweet potato fries that came in a wire basket with small metal pots of mayo and ketchup, and I listened to her talk, and I watched and I watched until all the mayo and the fries were gone, but the ketchup stayed untouched. It was the last time I will do that. I read an article online about the political views of a stand-up comedian, and it was the last time I will do that. I watched the first scene of a 1970s screwball comedy out of nostalgic curiosity and it was the last time I will do that. I heard music broadcast on the radio and it was the last time I will do that. I cared about something happening in another country because I heard about something happening in another country and it was the last time I will do that. I watered a plant that I had made exist just so I could look at it, and it was the last time I will do that. I sat on some steps by a grating. I listened to a tube station announcement as it drifted through the air vents, and it was the last time I will do that. I considered my dating options, and it was the last time I will do that. I sat with my husband and we exchanged a glance and that glance said only, I am glad we are in this room together and nothing fearful and it was the last time I will do that. I sat and watched a young man try out some poetry in a cafe and it was the last time I will do that. I paid in cash and it was the last time I will do that. I woke up because of the rubbish lorry and it was the last time I will do that. I thought about Kate Bush, and it was the last time I will do that. I slept with the heating on, and it was the last time I will do that. I saw sushi, and it was the last time I will do that. I saw a frog in the park by the bus stop, and it was the last time I will do that. I saw the traffic part for an ambulance and it was the last time I will do that. I wondered about whether I should get a pension and it was the last time I will do that. I decided to buy one of two fractionally different kinds of biscuit and I 
took time over that decision, weighing its pros and cons because it felt in the moment important. And it was the last time I will do that. I saw a friend and their children. And when we parted, I was certain I would see them again and all would be well and their family would be whole. And it was the last time I will do that. I cut my finger and stopped thinking about the possibilities of infection almost immediately. And it was the last time I will do that. I regretted for a moment that I don't have kids and it was the last time I will do that. I gave money to charity and it was the last time I will do that. I looked down at the city street from my office window without thinking, this is madness. This is incomprehensible madness to live like this. And it was the last time I will do that. I chose to learn something for pleasure and it was the last time I will do that. I thought about the kids I knew when I was a kid and the long days inventing things to do until the sun started going down over the wasteland near the derelict railway bridge. And it was the last time I will do that. I let my gaze run across a building for the pleasure of the architecture rather than wondering where, if anywhere, there were hidden people watching me. And it was the last time I will do that. I knew in my bones that violence of any sort is an unacceptable way of securing the things you want in daily life. And it was the last time I will do that. I trusted water and it was the last time I will do that. I did not know the meaning of the words clathrate deposit and it was the last time I will do that. I wondered how immune I am to advertising and to what extent I just think I'm immune and how the belief that you're immune to manipulation makes you incredibly susceptible to certain techniques of manipulation. And it was the last time I will do that. I unthinkingly trusted that a string of numbers on my phone represented in any meaningful way a specific set of resources I could somehow have real world access to if I wanted. And it was the last time I will do that. I believe the system might change, but ultimately will not fail. And it was the last time I will do that. I saw nobody die. And it was the last time I will do that. I knocked on the window of a cafe because a friend walked past and it was the last time I will do that. I bled that stupid fucking radiator in the bedroom and it was the last time I will do that. I waited for my laptop to boot up and it was the last time I will do that. I shut the door behind me and knew that the room I just walked into was mine and it was the last time I will do that. I had the option to sit and think about all this rather than to live in it and it was the last time I will do that. All of these things I just said to you, all of them, they will be true. Perhaps not on the same day, but they will all be true. Start to grieve. Do it consciously, systematically. Because so much grief takes practice, it takes rehearsal and you cannot do it all at once. And when the time comes, when all this collapses, you can't be so sad that there's no fucking sushi. Your ability to help people disappears. It's the sadness that will make us cruel. The inability to deal with so much of it at once. And maybe the best way we've got to prepare for all this going is to act like it's already gone. So we've got two more extracts. Um, <clears throat> this next one's quite short and it's uh, it's probably about 10 years old. It's the oldest thing that I'm reading. And it's the um, final speech from a play that I wrote called There Has Possibly Been an Incident. Um, the play's about kind of uh, how everyone thinks on some level that the decisions they make are the right ones and it tells various stories of people who you know caused uh damage or 
did in in one case an absolutely terrible thing uh, but thought that they were doing the right thing at the time and one of the strands in it is uh, about a guy who commits a terrorist attack on a parliament building um, and some young people um, because of his beliefs about um, his culture being threatened and about how he um, he nevertheless thinks of him himself as a hero. Um, so this final speech kind of describes the action that that man took, but from the perspective of um, someone who, for me, made the uh, makes the only really heroic decision in the play, um, because they simply react uh, to the events that are unfolding in front of them in a way that um, uh, in a way that attempts to make them better. And at the end of the play, this is um, this is the speech that all three performers give um, at the same time in unison. <clears throat> and I've actually been in this. I stepped in a couple of times. I'm really glad there's just me here because it is a really fucking difficult thing um, to be asked to do in, in absolutely simultaneously with other people. Um, so, yeah. This is the ending of there has possibly been an incident. He comes across the floor of the entrance lobby. Of course, at that point, I don't know it's him. He's dressed as a woman. His face is covered. He looks like nothing out of the ordinary. I don't mean this to be dismissive. It's just that when you see a lot of people, it really takes something particular for one of those people to stand out. His face, his body's hidden. I, mean, I guess it was a costume. He was pretending, wasn't he, to be something he wasn't. I think... I can't believe now that I thought this, but I think... I think the gunshots and music, drums and hand claps. I'm trying to remember if there's, I don't know, some kind of performance scheduled or a demonstration. Some of them can be pretty out there, you know, pretty weird. You don't know what it is they're actually upset about until you think about it, unpick it a bit. Sometimes not even then. Of course, it's not really my job to understand it. It's something that goes on where I work. I think the falling people, mostly children, I think it's dancing. I think the falling people are dancers. Of course, this doesn't last more than, uh, more than seconds. I see what's going on. And the strange thing, the strange thing is, it is as if he's dancing. The black cloak or whatever that he's wearing billows out around him. As he... It's a beautiful piece of architecture where I work. High, wide, it reflects on and on. It's got these ribs. It's a bit like being in a whale skeleton a bit like being in a station but it feels like the kind of place where important things get done so in that space it sounds important when the first grenade goes off a teenager lands in front of me and spills all over the floor and i am running and i am running clearing broken chairs he stands over a girl. He stands over a girl in a blue denim dress, and I hope his concentration is so total he neither fires again or looks up before I get there. I think, I hope that. I might not have, though. I probably, there was probably no thought. I should have been thinking of my own daughter. As I ran towards the girl, I maybe should have been thinking of my own daughter, imagining her in that situation. But if I'd started thinking of her, of my own daughter, I would have stopped. 
I know I would have stopped because the, in that situation is this girl in the blue denim dress isn't my daughter and that would have stopped me, I think. I think I shouted. It's true. Anyone would have done. Anyone would have done what I did in the same situation. I honestly believe that. I have to believe that. I shouted, he turned towards me. Between us at this point, there is a table. There are two teenagers under the table. I think one of them is already dead. I jump the table from this point on after he has turned towards me, after I start my jump over the table. From the moment my feet leave the floor, we have eye contact. There's no surprise. He isn't surprised to see me. It's like I'm an expected part of the situation, a factor he's already considered, a mechanic of the game. Someone will always do this. And this thought, weird thought, why am I thinking of my daughter? I don't have any children. And immediately following now, another thought, it doesn't matter. I don't have any children and it doesn't matter because children are children. Nothing makes these children special. Nothing would make my children, if I had them, more special than these. It doesn't matter. I was flying over the table, arms stretched out towards him when he finally shot me. Two bullets. Two bullets equals three fingers and an eye. It's not a bad sum. Two bullets take three fingers, one eye, and my momentum carries me onto him, and we fall, and his gun falls, and I am holding onto him with my one good hand, ramming my forehead into his face over and over, and suddenly there are other arms on him and on me. I dream about that. It wasn't what I did, or at least it was only what I did first. I had the opportunity in that sense. I was lucky. But without those other arms, it would have been impossible. The girl, she... The girl, she died, but she was the last one that day. She was the last one to die. And I did that. I stopped it, not on my own and too late, but I did that. At least I did that. Um, all right, so this is the the final um, piece of the reading. It's the end of the, it's the third extract from the Royal Court Climate Commission play. Again, never been read before in public. Um, uh, and it's the, it's what I think will be probably the ending. Um, sorry, this has run slightly long because we had to repeat something, but I hope everyone's been able to uh, here uh, and see. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to I'm going to just zip through this final one, which is the the last bit of always maybe the last time. It's okay. It's okay. Let me send you away with some hope. Hope looks forward, but it draws its energies from the past from knowing histories, including our victories and their complexities and imperfections. It means not being the perfect, that is the enemy of the good, not snatching defeat from the jaws of victory, not assuming you know what will happen when the future is unwritten and part of what happens is up to us. Yeah. Well, where does that leave us when the future is written? I started this with a dream, an invented dream, but all dreams are invented. So here's another. 
you, me, all of us. We're sitting in an old building in a city, a building built by the richest people in that city at a time when its architecture was the pinnacle of the available technology, built to last. Huge dark rooms that were lit first by candles and artfully cut glass lenses, then by gas, then by electricity. But the rooms themselves in that building have never changed. They're so much bigger than the people in them, than us. And in this room, this huge room with its floor length windows that let in light and let out heat. So we have to put so much energy in them to keep them warm. These rooms in which physics itself work to remind the occupants of the huge riches in a literal sense, the excess that allow them to exist. We are sitting around this room in these really old, really comfortable chairs. Let's not worry too much right now about how the room got there. The important thing is it exists. Let's not worry about whose labour, paid or unpaid, whose energy, whose exploitation and coercion got it there. Or rather, let's recognise that all rooms like this one are built on slavery and coercion, at least the ones as old as this one is. But this is the room we have, and we're all in it. What do we do in the room? We wait. We read newspapers that appear on the carved dark wood side tables distributed around the dark wood floor. A table for each group of four leather bound chairs facing inwards, wing backed leather bound chairs with the leather fastened to them with buttons that stretch it and create this regular pattern of dimples. You know, the pattern that says luxury, but old luxury. They're going to stop doing that, whatever that technique's called, with the buttons and the leather on chairs. It's a skill we are going to lose. It is superfluous. But that particular thing, I think it will still fascinate people that we don't do it anymore. And in the room, we read the newspapers and we wait. None of us know how many chairs there are in the room. It's a long room, lost in distance in either direction along its length. The windows seem to go on forever. But, I mean, they don't. They probably don't. We're all just sitting around in these beautiful chairs in the old imperial architecture waiting to die sitting around on beautiful chairs in these grand old rooms. The high ceilings above us, the polished dark wood floors, bouncing our words up and around to make them sound important. We know something's happening outside. That outside there is struggle and such an effort, straining every human sinew to find new ways that will keep enough of us alive for long enough to build an alternative to this room, this building. But we sit, reading the paper, looking at the shapes of old maps in frames on the walls as if the lines drawn on those maps were laws like physics and not just the product of years of human belief filtered through momentary decisions. But there's a noise outside and the noise outside gets louder and louder until the walls shake, until bone china made with some stolen manufacturing process falls to a floor made of stolen hardwood and shatters until the latches on those huge windows shake themselves free. And eventually someone gets up and walks on the now heaving floor to the nearest window. They throw the shutters open to look down into the street and up over the roofs of the buildings opposite, which are the only horizon most of us really know. And in the sky, 
above that stone canyon in the cruel blue sky someone has pushed the last remaining engines of one of the last operational passenger flights to their limit we can't hear the passengers screaming at this distance but they have wrestled those human lives in that archaic metal tube to defy gravity for one last time and across the sky with the exhaust of that final aeroplane they have written this. They've written, this is how the movie ends. A bunch of people of no qualification that has been granted by a recognized body of an extant country sit silently by a lake that is half the size it used to be. Those people have no access to the other similar groups that exist at the same time across the world. Maybe those other groups aren't by lakes. Maybe they're in repurposed school gym halls or religious buildings that fell into disuse. Maybe they're sheltering under outcrops of ancient rock or in city centre parks. Maybe there's already a wide band encircling the world where people cannot be at all. But these people have bought something here. Maybe they've bought an object. Maybe not. Maybe they've bought the record of a process or the demonstration of a skill. Each of them carry something like that. And alongside it, they carry this deep acceptance of their own death. Of the fact of their own death and the knowledge that their own death doesn't really matter. This group of people by the lake, though, they sit like all the other groups. Maybe they take in their surroundings. I mean, people are still moved by beauty. There is still beauty. They take in the mountains that surround the lake on three sides, the broken and rocky bowl that has not supported ice for years, bare on the upper slopes, but still some green clinging to the lower where the lake shore used to be. Maybe there's bird song. There is probably still bird song. There is probably still beauty. There is probably still even a stream somewhere feeding water into the lake. A trickle compared to what it used to be, but it is still there sometimes. There used to be fish here too. There probably still are, but who knows for how long. On the grey beach, that for thousands of years was lake bed, but for a few short years has been just a grey beach. These people, they use sticks and small stones to carve out a grid system in the dry earth, a pattern of squares. Not too many squares, maybe twice as many squares as there are people. And slowly, over the course of a day, taking frequent rests and sharing out the food and water they've carried up here into the mountains, the people take turns to explain the things they've bought. A piece of old technology, a set of instructions for shepherding a seed into a plant and a plant into a crop, a way of resolving an argument before it escalates into violence, a hand-powered generator attached to a hard drive and a home-built speaker. Maybe some of the objects are even dark jokes, like instructions on how to make half-remembered things that won't be made again, like ice cream. Each person explains what they have chosen to bring here and why, and if the group decides to allow it, which they mostly do, the object or record or process is given one of the squares to sit in. And when everything has its place and every square that's going to be filled is filled, the group walk around almost like they might have in an old museum, except they're looking at the future. They're looking at what they've decided to keep. And I guess they're mourning everything they've decided not to and inoculating themselves against returning to the things they've left behind at the same time. They don't know if this will work. 
they probably, most of them, wish it hadn't got to this point. They also know that things were at this point, the point where doing this was a necessary step, a lot earlier than they were prepared to admit. If they'd come round to it earlier, they might have saved more, but there it is. At least they've made a choice. At least they've made a choice rather than being the other people. The ones who sat around in old rooms, watching each other die, not even realising they were doing it. So that, that might be the end of the new show. Who knows? Uh, it's definitely the end of this reading. Um, and thank you for um, thank you for being here and, and thank you for listening. Um, we're going to take a going to take a five minute break now and then uh, Nico from Besner Theatre is going to take over uh, and be joined by Tanuja and Nimisha and we're going to have a conversation um, I just want to say as well as like it's been great to be able to share this with you that um, this is a free event but if you look on the event page uh, on Besner's website uh, there are links if you feel inclined to donate to two organisations. Um, one is the Trussell Trust, who um, are responsible for providing a lot of the food bank provision here in the UK and do a lot of great work doing that. And the other one is Detention Action, who are um, a small charity, again, based in the UK, um, dedicated to supporting people who are in immigration detention, but also um, campaigning for the end of um definite immigration detention and uh, a reform of the uh, the system that allows it okay um i'm going to switch my camera off uh for five minutes now and go mute and we're going to have a little five minute break
Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the second edition of GLOD Political Theatre as a Civil Right, a fortnightly online platform presenting political theatre from around the world, hosted by HowlRound Creative Theatre Commons. My name is Nico Vakari. Um, I'm a co-artistic director and co-founder of Besna Theatre, a British-Romanian political theatre collective committed to using theatre to investigate, expose and confront institutional and normalised violences. Thank you so much for joining us for our first event. Um, and thank you to the forever inspiring Crystal for, from Manchester in the UK for the incredible reading uh, tonight. And thank you to everyone who's joined us um, for your patience with the technical issues at the beginning of the streaming. Um, I do want to just remind everyone that those who missed the beginning, um, that the um, the whole of tonight's event will be um, available on the HowlRound website to watch whenever you want, along with all the other GLOD events. Um, and yes, thank you again, Chris, for such an engaging and striking reading. For tonight's discussion, we are joined by two wonderful panellists who um, I'd like for you to both introduce yourself. So can we start with you, please? Yeah, Manisha? sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Manisha Patel. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist and I'm based in London in the UK. And most of my work actually is with survivors of gross human rights violations. So that's a bit about me. Thank you and welcome to Misha. And Tanuja. Hi, yeah, I'm Tanuja Amrasuria. I'm a director, a dramaturg and a sound designer. Work across uh, different art forms, including theatre. And I'm based in Bristol in the UK. Thank you, welcome Tanuja. Um, so amongst many of the concepts and ideas interrogated in the extracts Chris shared with us tonight, um, one in particular that stood out to me um, was concerning apathy and passivity. Um, of the individual or of the collective. Um, so to start us off, my first question is for you, Nimisha. I was wondering whether from a clinical psychology and human rights perspective, you could um, contextualize the mechanisms of apathy and passivity when facing disasters or social um, political violences. Mm. I mean, I think that's it's a really good question to kick us off already because it, it sort of pinpoints, um, I suppose it points to the, the, the kind of underlying processes, um, you know, beneath apathy and passivity and they're different things. And sometimes we conflate them, but they are actually different. So for me, kind of apathy is a sort of state of indifference, you know, and it's not, it's not static it, as a state, you, you know, we move in and out of apathy and it's, but it is a kind of disconnect from um, compassion, compassion for the other. Um, and sometimes I think it's a reflection of our own um, privilege, individualist values, you know, am I all right? Or as long as I'm all right. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, things that we see um, or we hear about in terms of uh, sociopolitical disasters or violence, it, they, they feel like they're so far away from our own lives um, and preoccupations and I think TV does that somehow as well you know you can kind of watch it but you can also when it gets a bit too much you can kind of channel hop just light touch of a button and it's gone out of your room out of your consciousness um, and you can distance yourself from that from that feeling that it that it brings up I, and I think that's kind of apathy the sort of ability and the privilege to be able to flick a button and say I don't need to see this I don't want to see this I don't want to feel this. But I think passivity is something different, or maybe it's just a kind of a reflection, what we see of apathy. It's the sort of non-action, um, you know, the absence of any kind of resistance or ab absence of any kind of um, action. It's a kind of retreat into inaction. And it, it's about, most of the time, I think it's about feeling overwhelmed. It's about feeling helpless. Sometimes it's about fear. Sometimes it's about feeling confused. Um, and, and, you know, with all of that sort of feeling overwhelmed, you kind of do nothing. And I, I do think that, that it's, it's, um, it's sometimes about self-preservation, you know, um, and sometimes it's about, or well, often, I, I suppose I'm talking about it. Let me talk, let me just unpack that, just, just to say there are two, two ways of thinking about it. Because I think if we're living in, 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 um, in, in, uh, in contexts where we are privileged on many, many dimensions, it's easier, um, easier to be passive, it's easier to be apathetic or indifferent. Um, it's a privilege to be indifferent, in fact. Um, and, you know, but when these 
catastrophes or disasters are like part of your everyday life, you know, the injustices, the inequalities, all of that, and, and you feel the effects of it on a daily, daily basis. What we might sometimes see as passivity is not inaction or passivity, it's actually just fatigue. It's that chronic, overwhelming fatigue and, uh, and, and what appears as indifference is actually a kind of fatigue and detachment. Um, as, you know, sometimes as a way of coping, because if you kind of resist and you get, you know, pushed back even more or there are reprisals or, you know, other kind of negative um, uh, impacts, you, you, you are, if, if you like, even worse off. So it costs you something to be active. So passivity is actually, for me, sometimes a form of, form of resistance. But I think in our kind of more privileged existence, you know, I think passivity is about not wanting to give up something, right? What do we have to give up? If you're really going to engage in action, you have to give up something. Uh, you have to give up time, you have to give up energy, and you have to give up some of your privilege. You know? So I, I think that there's some of the issues that go on and they, they do vary according to the context in which we live. Thank you for that. Um, absolutely. And I, I, I mean, at least personally, when I was listening to um, Chris's um, reading this, this evening and when I was reading the extracts um, a few days ago, um, all of those elements were incredibly present for me. Um, and this, this particular, this idea of not wanting to give up something um, and this state of indifference that was, I don't know, I, really, I, I saw that as my own kind of experience as well, um, being in Britain and, um, and my own kind of a history and looking back at my own relationship with do I do something do I not um before I move on I just wanted to ask you Namisha whether there are obviously like um nuances in what you've just described according to different cultures and nation states etc and I was just wondering whether there's anything um specific to, to mention regarding passivity and apathy within the British context any specific nuances yeah um that's a <laughs> like, look, in the I think it's complicated, right? Because we live, I think, in the UK in a society with in a history of um, immense privilege, but it's immense privilege that's been gained by calculated and kind of um, systematic mass exploitation and brutality of other peoples. It came, it came with you know with, with a price that other people paid, um, and yet today we still have so many social inequalities in our own context. People that, you know, maybe if you're not living here, people wouldn't, would, would, would find in, in, you know, incredible. Um, you know, we, we have child poverty, we have fuel poverty. I mean, like, how is it possible in a kind of, you know, uh, seemingly affluent country that we can have such gross injustices and inequalities? And, and, you know, and I think in that, if you think about that, I think, you know, is that about apathy? Is that about passivity? I don't think so. I think it's a, it goes back to privilege. It goes back to the function of, of, of power, you know, because we fiercely, fiercely guard that privilege and that's why those inequalities still persist. I don't think it's kind of by default, there is a kind of, there is an active choice to preserve privilege. Um, and, and, I, and I don't think, you know, if we're talking about sort of people in general or that, you know, not, not wanting to generalize, I don't think, we could say the British people are apathetic uh, or passive. And I think we only have to look at more recent kind of um, uh, movements such as Extinction Rebellion or Me Too or Black Lives Matter. Um, and, you know, but it, it, they, they, they kind of show us something, right? That there isn't indifference and, and that people have had enough. They've had enough of indifference. They've had enough of inequalities and injustices. Um, and also, I think social media is a really powerful tool for us, right? Particularly, I think, in kind of, well, I was going to say younger generations because I'm not on social media. Um, but it is it is a really powerful tool in that it somehow feels easier to, um, to challenge uh, apathy. On the other hand, it's also easier for people to be armchair activists, right? It's really quick and easy to send a five-word tweet um, and, you know, but never do anything, never actually make any difference. And people think that tweeting is, is kind of, that's, that's their bit. <laughs> and so that, that, that's, I think, really um, frustrating for me. But I, but I think I, I'm hopeful about younger generations because I think there's a fire, there's a fire um, burning. Sorry to, to use the, the, um, the metaphor, <laughs> 
that um, you used, Chris, as well, but in a different way. But I do think there's there's a kind of real fire of of um, fighting against indifference. It's like they've had enough, and quite rightly so, quite rightly so. And that gives me hope. So I don't. I I think it's. Um, I think we're we're in a, we're in a place where we can choose. We can choose to do something differently. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um, yeah, it's so interesting to hear you speak, Marisha, and, and that this kind of um, your uh, the, the way you kind of so beautifully expressed that the kind of the, 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 your proposition of um, the difference between apathy and passivity as being around kind of notions of of connection and disconnection. Um, I think is really helpful because this I, I I was thinking a lot during your reading, Chris, about choice and about um, how we kind of understand the responsibility of our choices and this notion of like doing our best and what does it mean to do your best? And I think that's really linked to this idea of um, privilege and power and the the notion that that doing your best is enough and this sort of kind of lack of imagination, I guess, for um, for thinking beyond the best that you know you can do. Um, and I think, and I guess the other thing that I've been thinking about um, in relation to that, sort of perhaps riffing off a little bit the idea of um, how how exhausting it can feel to like, to, to try and to feel like you have to, to take action on everything the sort of the scale of um some of the crises we're meeting is is like it is enormous and it it, it isn't something that only one person can change but that kind of you know the, the the idea of um needing need like everyone needing to take leadership in their own in, in their own selves but kind of remembering that we are we are a a, a community um, and that that uh, is a that's an accumulation that is really powerful is interesting but also kind of are there are there ways to understand action um, that doesn't look like the way that we tend to expect action to look because I think there's a lot of um, there's the idea that that resistance should be visible in certain ways or can be noticed in certain ways and it's performed in certain ways. And I wonder whether there are different ways to understand uh, action um, that might help us kind of see different types of uh, collective action, I guess, in, in places that we're not noticing it. And through that, that maybe we can kind of take a different kind of energy and push towards different types of hope. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's really interesting, um, this idea of resistance as a performance and actually whether, I guess it comes down to the idea whether what the intentions are behind that type of resistance or that active resistance, whether they're hollow or they're sincere. Um, and I guess at least to a part that um, that actually ma that, that makes it, um, a lot more significant and actually impactful for actually what they're claiming to what what the act is claiming to 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 fight for and to resist against i guess uh, before i move on to the next question chris did you have anything you wanted to add to that i found both of those answers really fascinating not much i suppose from a specific point of view of like <clears throat> someone who's engaged in particularly at the moment in a process about thinking about not just how theatre can make people active, but whether it it should be trying, whether it's the right thing for it to be trying to do, whether it's not a kind of it's 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 really it's really useful to have that insight into, you know, the um the different kinds of um inactivity the different flavors of inactivity that it's useful to imagine that you're you're helping you're, you're not helping but you're you're identifying and encouraging people to kind of come out of 
because I've always I've, I've I've got more and more suspicious, um, particularly as I've done more thinking and writing around the whole climate crisis. Um, I've become more and more suspicious of the idea that theatre can be in any way an effective uh, rallying cry or kind of um, call to arms or revolution. But I've become more and more convinced that one of the things it can do is identify the workings of the human mind, you know, the underlying structures and, and ways of dealing with the world and information that stop those things for hap from happening and at least sending people away with an enhanced awareness of of if they're not doing it, why they're not doing it, and maybe try and get in through that way. I totally agree with um, Namisha, your ideas about privilege. I think the kind of the kind of unwillingness to confront the situation that we could be in in any active way for most people in this country is a kind of self-damaging result of privilege. Um, you know, the idea that we've never... That there's a there's a there's a lot of people in this country who've never had to really consider the precarity of the frameworks that gave them the privilege to not consider those frameworks um, is you know is is kind of the is kind of the enemy that I'd like to be fighting rather than making work that says get out on the streets and and do you know do some do something about it because I think there are there are actually more effective ways to encourage people to do that than than fear. Yeah, that is absolutely fascinating. Um, and I'm actually very curious, Chris, if you don't mind, like um, explaining a little bit more about how, this kind of journey that you've been on um, and the thoughts that what what provoked you to think about how maybe theatre is unable to, or maybe shouldn't uh, be a tool to rally the people, but actually identify maybe something more nuanced. That's fascinating. Cause I, I love, I'm still in love with the idea and the dream that actually theater can rally people and can intimidate politicians and the establishment. Um, but I would love to hear more about like kind of that process for you. Yeah, I suppose that's, it's not a, <laughs> It's not. It's not really phrased in a way that's helpful for you as a kind of activist theatre maker, is it? And I, I certainly didn't mean that there isn't value in doing the kind of thing that Besner does of, uh, you know, shining a light on the injustices of the world and, um, and and giving people very clear pathways to follow if they want to do something about that. There is, of course, a huge amount of value in that, but I don't think a lot of theatre does it in that way. I think we. I think there's a um, there's a kind of feeling that the you know the the literary power of our storytelling or our skill and craft that kind of the construction of allegory or you know the the story the story that we try to um, energize people with of a world in a hundred years time when everything's underwater or, <laughs> or whatever is it somehow has this has a power in in and of itself that will i mean i'm talking specifically about climate when i talk about this i'm not talking about immigration detention i'm not talking about the arms industry i'm not talking about all these things that you you know that 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 that, that you deal with economic inequality things that you deal with although obviously none of those things are they're all connected to each other. But I'm talking about the uh, something that you, I think you don't do, which is story as activism. You know, narrative as activism, character as activism. I don't, I don't think those things are necessarily as effective as we think they are. And I think taking advantage of the fact that it's a quiet collective space in which to show people the world, but also... More importantly, show them how their minds process the world and say, why are we so bad at doing anything about We evidently know. No one walks into a theatre to a show about climate change not knowing that it's happening. 
I really honestly don't think that's the case. And I, I would say for most theatres, the vast majority of the audience walk in, not only knowing that it's happening, but knowing a lot of how it's happening and why it's happening and being of the opinion that it is a bad thing that it is happening. So why the fuck tell them a story that encourages them to get them out on the street or or shows them a possible dark future that is designed to kind of make them those things when they already are those things when they walk in? Why not take advantage of the fact that you've got a bunch of people in a collective uniquely for most, you know, I think uniquely among art forms in a collective space where you can ask them to in real time feel the way that their minds are working around these subjects and not just what the subjects are. So I don't think it's a, I don't think I'm being down on activist theatre and I probably didn't choose my words with much care. Um, but what I am, what I am down on is activist story or activist speeches. I think there are better ways to achieve those things that aren't that aren't necessary that can be done in different you know different ways than theatre does. I couldn't agree with you more. I couldn't agree with you more. And it's a question with with us at Besant that we're constantly grappling with. Like part of me still feels like you know with every show that we do or like that we dream like how what is what are the what are the components that didn't quite get us there in the last show? Where can we take it? Where can we take it next? What what is missing? Um, and I, I couldn't I couldn't agree with you more, Chris. And again, I, from what I am from what I, I took from what you just said, like again, moving away from story, narrative, and character, but and I totally agree with that. There's a lot of things to unpack there as well. But for me, I think just uh, from what um, I understood from what you said as well, is like engaging the audience with their minds, to put it quite crudely. I guess, like getting them to put A, B and C together, you know, and getting them to think for themselves and not feeding them the horror, not feeding them that. But actually, I think, at least I think that's the heart of a lot of political, effective political theatre practice, which is getting the audiences to engage in the dialectic, getting them to engage in the argument themselves, as opposed to just being spoon fed. Um, and I, I kind of wanted to ask you, um, Tunja, as well, um, as like a director, dramaturg, and, and sound designer, how do you feel about uh, how do you feel about this? What kind of like what are your thoughts and like what have you grappled with? Yeah, it's interesting. So I've like I've never called myself an activist um, because uh, I mean, though I campaign on certain things, I certainly don't. Um, I feel like. Uh, to to call myself an activist would be to, to it would just be a lie because I don't spend all that time doing that doing that work, um, and I really agree with Chris. Maybe it's because like a similar age or jaded in the same way. But that that kind of those that theatre is not um, it's not it, it's a space filled with 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 people who are trying to do good things a lot of the time, but. Um, or maybe, but it's it's not the place that that, that action always happens. Um, so I think there are two things about that. I I do, I definitely think that theatre, because theatre is a it's a it's a constructed space. So it is a really great. It can be a really great place to examine structures and environments and how we behave and think and respond to those structures and environments. Um, and I've certainly seen work that has kind of really pushed at that. Um, in a way that it's kind of really like forced the audience to attend to their own behaviors in those situations. Um, but I think it can also be, yeah, absolutely a space to, to kind of reflect on our intellectual behaviors. But there's also, I think, it just sort of, I was thinking about the kind of, um, the questions around ideas of story and narrative and character. I work a lot with imaginative fiction and, and I was just sort of trying to think about like what are the approaches um, that I'll often take in relation to um, kind of like political issues and uh, issues that are like real world um, concerns. And I think there's potentially a space to, as well as the kind of intellectual um, 
attention that's required. There's something that story can do that can be about understanding the emotional consequences of these massive problems. Um, because again, in sort of like getting people to care, getting people to see that this is our this is our problem, and um, that to to think that it's not happening to me is just like that's that's just a lie. Um, and I do think sometimes um, finding surprising ways into revealing those emotional consequences is can be a can be a valuable way of like getting under people's skin with these things. I think a lot of the time that what's um that that aspiration is sort of uh applied to things that are actually just the writer spouting their own like opinions and statements and that's not really what it's doing but if you can get beyond that in a way that invites audiences to to kind of um to care or to like to in a way that that they haven't been asked to before um then I think that can be quite powerful. Absolutely. And I think that just takes us further, doesn't it, down this line of what I get. So if we put it into the context of the climate catastrophe, yes. uh, so there's a thing when we've done shows on, when we've done one show um, um, a while ago now, um, Vino Vata, about capitalism and, and, and um, the climate crisis. When we were researching, there's this, I can't remember the actual phrase now, but this kind of like this like void that a lot of activists or researchers enter the first time that they're actually looking at the issue head on and that they're actually understanding. And from a lot of, of all the different kind of like subjects and issues and violences that we can do a show about or to explore, it seems that this idea of the catastrophe, the climate catastrophe seems to be deeply overwhelming. And I guess, so Chris, did you have that experience? Like what was your experience like, like working on a, a show about the climate catastrophe? That's a big question, but sorry. But I think that's gonna help contextualize some of the few questions. It wasn't the subject I was interested, uh, I was, it wasn't the subject I was uninterested in, but obviously, you know, writing about it requires a bit more than being interested in it. And again, yeah, it was terrifying. It was absolutely terrifying. Um, and what, but, but again, what is, it's about that, you know, it, if you think about it as a void that you go into, a kind of void which can be, trigger the kind of inactions that Nimish is talking about, um, you know, partly because you have the luxury actually day by day at the moment of not really caring about it that much where I live. Um, then you can either, you know, I'm much more interested. What I became much more interested in is talking about the, I always talk about it. I don't really think of it as a void, but something that I talk about when I talk to people about writing a lot is like the most effective writing, the most effective theatre for me is, um, imagine theatres are like a bucket of water and your water is your content i'm far more interested in making like store uh, like making work about the shape of the bucket you know so that void is a delineated thing that has those thoughts around it that prevents you from getting to it or paralyzes you when you're in it or you know it's actually much i, I found it much more useful to kind of look at the structures around that fear and acknowledge that I was I was scared and I was passive and I was terrified the more I learned. But also, you know, it's uh, uh, also what impulses that then gives you to look in other places for things that are going to reassure you or to, to try and take the line of least resistance when it comes to things that you can do to mitigate that or, or mitigate the situation. You know, and 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 not really think about what is really effective, but think about what is reassuring. It's not about then standing up and saying, "Okay, so like to be effective, you have to do this, this, and this, and this." It's about using the opportunity to say, "Isn't it interesting that this is the reaction?" And perhaps if we think about the reaction and the way we're thinking, we think about the bucket and not the water. You know, how can we better equip ourselves? 
to kind of maneuver around those thought processes and think about actually how we think and how we can make the way we think useful. Do you see what I mean? Probably, in a way. I don't know. That's a really useful... Well, yeah, I was, I was fucking... But, uh, yeah, I mean, to, the short answer is I was fucking terrified. <laughs> and I think it's probably... It's... It, it, and, and, you know, of course I'm terrified of the worst consequences. You know, and they might not happen. But the really effective thing to do is assume that they will. Because that's... If you prepare for them happening, then you're... If you're prepared for the worst that could happen, then you've got kind of full spectrum preparedness. If it's not as bad, if it turns out not to be as bad. But then we bear in mind that, like, if you look at the, uh, you know, in the early 90s, the the climate predictions, um, that the first big round of climate predictions had an appendix that effectively said, now, scientifically, we probably should say that these consequences are possible, but we're putting them in the appendix because... Um, they're really, really fucking unlikely. But in 25 years, this is the kind of thing that might be happening. And it's everything in that appendix that's happening now. So, you know, it, in in those terms, it, it there probably is good reason to actually think about what the worst could possibly be. Because the worst of 30 years ago is 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 in some ways what's happening now. And I don't know. Even, even think about it right now, and you know, I try to engage as much as possible in the idea of the climate crisis and what I can do as an individual. But even thinking about it now in this po- this discussion, I can feel almost like that physical knot in me of like wanting to refuse to to engage with it because it is terrifying. And whether I'm in Romania or the UK, I do see physically, as opposed to also politically and economically, the consequences of what is happening around us. Um, and Nimisha, I was wondering whether you've got anything you'd like to add to this idea of um, maybe you've got any reflections on how theatre's role in like provoking awareness um, and maybe trying to ignite some sense of responsibility or inspiration or kind of like some argument or intellectual or um, engagement with with our own passivity, our own apathy. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm. It's. I was listening really carefully to what you were saying, Chris, as well, and uh, and um, found myself slipping into a kind of hopelessness. <laughs> so I'm going to resist that. <laughs> um, not not because I think you know, because I think I connected with a, a lot of what you were saying, and and I guess my own doubts as well. Um, I think the first thing to say is that, you know, I personally think theatre is an incredibly powerful tool for lots of lots of things. I think at the, the most um, kind of first level, not basic level, is its capacity to just touch. You know, it allows us to, it just transports us into a space where we allow ourselves as the audience to be touched, to be moved, um, and to not defend in the way that we might in our living rooms when you know a flick channel hop or you you know go away and make a cup of tea or whatever it forces you to somehow stay there and to be to be open now having said that I think it, it it's useful in that is it useful in raising awareness I'm not so sure about that because I think again the point you made Chris you know I think who who is the audience um who are the people who 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 watch this, who are the people who are interested in these issues, it's usually the converted. And, and you know, you, it can, can kind of become a bit of an echo chamber. And you also almost sort of feel like you can pat yourself on the back because you've gone to see a bit of political theatre. Um, but actually, that's not what you're looking for, right? It's not just the kind of patting each other on the back. So raising awareness, I'm not so sure. I think it could be much more or I've seen it be, I guess, more powerful and effective when it reaches audiences that wouldn't ordinarily want to hear or feel these feelings or hear these issues. Um, but I, I think I think in terms of whether it can mobilize people into action, that's another matter. So I think there's one about theater is really helpful in, and powerful in touching and moving. Is it helpful in awareness raising? Well, it depends how you do it and where you do it and who you're doing it with. 
is it effective in um, in shifting people, really shifting people? I mean, that, that's that's a whole different conversation, which I have a lot of thoughts on, but that's, yeah. I do wonder whether this idea of the effectiveness of theatre's ability to mobilise people changes, at least as we spoke earlier as well, with the nuances of like when the theatre in different countries, you know, like we can't, if we contextualise it a little bit in different countries, I wonder whether people react differently and have a different relationship. Like certainly working between the UK and Romania, the, the audiences are very different. Um, Romania, in Romania, you generally get a lot more politicized people because of the recent history and, and lots of other aspects as well to consider. Uh, and I always find it so strange when I've been in Romania for a very long time and I go back to the UK and go to the theater and the audience is just so different, so different. Um, and again, on this question, Chris, I, I was wondering whether I could talk a little bit about like in your work and how you and your own relationship as an artist, theatre artist with the audience. So for me, there's since I've always seen your work for a while now, there's always a direct and clear relationship with the audience. Um, and this relationship always has a very lasting effect on I me. Mean, I can remember years ago when I saw it at the Soho, um, there's possibly been an incident and that experience still stays with me. It wasn't just something materialistic. It wasn't something hollow, a exp hollow experience that kind of I forgot about. Um, that was a very special moment and it really stayed with me. And my question for you is in two parts. Um, first of all, for you, why is this direct and almost familiar relationship, if I can call it that, um, with the audience important, that's A. And B, how does this relationship coincide with another striking strand that I felt that ran through all of the extracts you've read tonight, which is the relationship between the older generations, the adults, to put it like that, and the younger and the future generations, which I feel is a really important question to interrogate. I didn't realise until I, I was like halfway through it tonight, I suddenly went, oh, fucking hell, all these, loads of this is about kids going to school. <laughs> Which is so weird. I haven't made that link. Um, which is not something that I'm personally involved with at the moment. I mean, obviously, I have friends. The, the one about the, the argument in the street about the pineal gland is kind of a true story that comes from a friend of mine, who, you know, that I stole. Um, but uh, well, that personal relationship with the audience, it's really interesting you think about how, I mean, I'm really lucky in that my stuff travels, but it sometimes travels with me, you know, the stuff that I perform. It's sometimes the version that I'm in or the original version that was, you know, the original version that was made. And sometimes it's other people doing it in other places. And I think, uh, I think there's kind of, it's really important to have that flexibility in it, whether it's you performing it or someone else who will be making those decisions about how it's performed to allow that latitude to kind of recraft that relationship with the audience. There's always a very clear conceptual relationship with the audience. And I don't think that changes for any given piece as it moves around, as in there'll be something at the heart of it, which is the task that the audience is set to do over and above simply be there. Uh, the kind of work that you're asking them to do and that won't change it will maybe be seen as more or less useful in different places because people will have different ways of relating to theatre around each other and there'll be different positions for theatre in any particular place in the world uh in this in whatever society or culture that that particular theatre or performance is but that won't change so for example something like victory condition which i've never been in but which i wrote which has a very clear ask for the audience to watch the action of one play while they're listening to the text of a completely different play. You know, that that fundamentally is what anyone who watches a production of that will be asked to do. But hopefully the latitude is left in it for people to interpret that according to what that personal connection with people might be and how it means and what it means to address people in a room where they are. Um, so hopefully that's inbuilt into any anything I do that someone else picks up and thinks, oh, I this is useful to me, which is just a mind-blowing thing that anyone would ever think that about something you'd written. And then the stuff when I'm actually there, I think one of the good things about having that relationship with an audience and about having a relationship with an audience where you, you are asking them to be present with you and look you in the eye and 
maybe you're even asking the new thing. Music can kind of, you won't be an expert in whatever culture you're performing in, in the time that you're there and during the time that you're performing there, but it means that at least you're present and you can, to the very limited extent it's possible, try and take that into account moment by moment and kind of alter the balance of a piece so that it can reach people. Um, I, uh, in terms of like the older generation and the younger generation, I don't know. I don't. I'm not. I'm not sure. I've done that on purpose in anything that I've. I've done for you. I don't think. I think there's maybe an unconscious thing about getting older when I start to think about a version of the world that I'm not in anymore. But I also think that one of the big cliches about doing sort of work that centers around global kind of um, power imbalances or crises is like, you know, what kind of world are we leaving our children, you know, kind of thing. And I'd, I'm not, I'm not interested in consciously addressing that because I think it lets you off the hook. <laughs> For a start, it lets me off the hook because, you know, if I start thinking like that, there's a temptation to think, well, you know, I don't have, I don't have kids. <laughs> Um, fuck them <laughs> but um, but uh, I mean that, that's obviously in, in jest because I deeply care about like all my you know my friends and my relatives children and I do want them to kind of not live in a miserable world but but I also think there's a there's a trapdoor in that thinking so I think it's uh, which allows you to let yourself off the hook so I think it's maybe hopefully accidental it's about it's more useful to think of what you are a version of yourself in the future through your actions now not in a kind of selfish way but in a kind of that idea of pre-grieving which is really important to the certainly the to always maybe the last time which is like being able to conceptualize like a future world that you are still in and where you have done the necessary prepar psychological preparation to be able to cope with the the uh you know what that world is going to throw at you and crucially to then make yourself useful to the people around you to to a, to the greatest extent you possibly can so i suppose it's more about a generational difference between me and future me rather than you know adults and kids not that me and future me are in different generations but you know what i mean yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, for me, I may, um, it was getting, I mean, f maybe it was just my personal experience, but it got me to question, like, our relationship with one another. Maybe it's not just between adults and kids, but actually it made me think about um, part of the issue, especially with the climate crisis, is our relationship with each other. And I don't want to use the word respect because it's not about respect, but it's, it comes back to this idea of privilege of like who's privileged to, to not drown, to not burn to death, to not die of starvation, to not die of thirst, et cetera, et cetera, or to die in a, a water wall, et cetera. Um, and it, I don't know, the, those, the questions are still running around in my head. So I want to thank you for getting me to engage with those thoughts because we should never have a moment where we're not thinking about them really, if we, if we consider that. Um, Tanusha, I wanted to ask you whether what your kind of um, thoughts were um, on the idea of the relationship between the audience and uh, and performance and, and theatre. Yeah, I think it's. I mean, the relationship between the audience and the the art. I think you know, not just in theatre, but I mean that is the most important relationship in in any sort of art making. And and I think it is absolutely in exactly that thing of what is the work. That the audience is doing here and what is the work that the audience is invited to do here and um and then and how then does this 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 space that you're constructing as an artist enable that in the most useful and surprising way for that audience those audience members and that can be about I mean, I think for me, like, one of the things that's really exciting about theatre is a possibility there is that you, because you're in the same space as the work and you're in the same space as quite often other people, 
there and that noticing of difference and the idea of, well, it's not just about what you think, but it's also about all these other people that are in the room with you and they're probably quite different from you. Um, and actually, if you ask all those questions, the work asks all of those questions that kind of gets beyond the superficial, oh yeah, we're here because we're all interested in climate change. We we know it's a big problem. We've got, we, we're here because we want to, we, we, we do want to do something about it. And if the, if the piece can just keep kind of taking the layers away until we get to a point where we're, we're, we are doing the work, whether it's act, kind of like um, visibly collectively or whether it's internally within the context of this collective, thinking about ways through this, ways that maybe we haven't thought about as individuals before, then I think that can be a really useful thing to take away and that can that can only happen there with the with the audience and that can be about and that's where um this thing I mean this notion of um I was really interested Chris in your in the first piece that you read when you in the, the bit about the dream and you ended it talking about like and then the dream ends and I, it just made me think about so what do we wake up to? And it made me think about this idea that actually quite a lot of the time we don't, we, you know, we see the kind of, we see the catastrophe, but we don't really think about like, what are we losing or what what is the kind of ideal uh, space that we want to keep hold of? What is the valuable stuff? What are we imagining that we want to um, kind of protect and steward and, hand over here and I wonder whether um yeah I, I feel like you know that's that's a really that's that's not the sort of dream that you can do by yourself that has to kind of happen with other people so um in terms of kind of what is the opportunity between the work and the audience it feels like it's that kind of really um not necessarily I don't think it's ever the sort of thinking that can become solid in you know, just one event, but it's part of that process, I think. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Nimisha, I was wondering whether, you said you had some thoughts earlier on kind of like some uh, some thoughts and reflections on how theatre can engage with, um, get people to maybe act directly or anything. And from your perspective, I'd love to hear that a little bit more. And as a, to contextualise something for everybody, I'd like to talk about this afterwards, but maybe you could start to contextualise your answer, Nimisha, with this. Apparently we've got a lot of comments on social media and stuff talking about like feelings of shame um, when thinking about climate change, uh, the climate catastrophe and our responsibility, our involvement in it. Um, I don't want to overload <laughs> unload that on you, but maybe if you could maybe contextualise that a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I'm not surprised <laughs> that, that a lot of those comments come, shame, guilt. Um, and, you know, they, they go hand in hand, don't they? They go hand in hand with, with anger and despair as well. And if I can just maybe unpack a little bit about why I think or how I think theatre can be useful. Um, it, I think... I think it's about striking a kind of balance, which is, I know it's a very, um, I don't do it, I don't know how to do it, that's what you're all very um, skilled at doing, but it's striking that balance between being able to open people sufficiently to be able to touch, to move, to prod their privilege, to tr prod that privilege that has uh, helped all of us, I guess, um, contribute to the current problems but and that when you prod that of course it evokes guilt it evokes shame it evokes you know kind of like oh god you know oh, and, and it evokes fear guilt all of those things but I but I think you, the balance is between kind of prodding that and opening that and creating a kind of lasting discomfort, not just while you're in the room or the space where you're, you know, absorbed in the theatre, but a lasting discomfort. And who goes to theatre to feel a lasting discomfort? But So you've got to strike that balance between creating kind of a lasting discomfort where the feelings don't become so overwhelming that our defences kick in and we smooth over them and we kind of walk out and go, OK, where are we going for, a, you know, a meal or where are we going, where are we going out now? What are we going to do now? 
Um, you know, like wanting people to somehow sit with it. I'm one of these people who never talks after theatre. I, I can't. I'm not interested in dissecting what I've heard or felt. I just need to stay with it and absorb it and just and my own kind of private thoughts and feelings over days, weeks to absorb it. And I know that everyone deals with it differently, but I think it's about kind of enabling people to stay with that discomfort, not shut the doors. But, and I think this is where the kind of potential for um, theatre to uh, foster resistance comes, is if people can stay connected to that discomfort and not react to their own sense of shame or guilt or feeling overwhelmed by just kind of shutting down. If we can do that, we may just, we may just begin to be in touch with our sort of creative imagination. You know, what, and this is what theatre can do. I want to feel that there is a seed that's planted in me that, 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 that sort of somehow awakens that kind of creative imagination of new possibilities. What could it look like? What could, could, what could life look like? What could I do differently? What, you know, how could it be better? Um, and I think that kind of process of both um, making people feel uncomfortable, but also giving kind of an opportunity to foster, uh, foster hope or foster, foster our imagination, I think is what really fuels collective hope. And I think that is the seeds of resistance. I don't think you go out from theatre thinking, let's go to the streets. I think this is a really a slow transformative process that we have to allow ourselves to dip into and out. You know, I go to theatre, I come out, I read something, I come out. But you have to want to stay with that discomfort and tolerate that discomfort if you can just see a glimpse, just a glimpse of a new possibility, a different way to be. Tanuja, Chris, would you like to add anything to that? I think that's absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, I think, I think the key to the, the planting of that seed that could potentially flower into having a different way of doing things moment by moment. Keeping that, I was thinking of it as keeping that door open between the theatre and the real world. So you're you're hopefully giving people that they can carry through that door rather than they just walk through that door and it shuts and they go, well, that was a nice hour and a half. You know, the trick to keeping that door open in terms of, particularly in terms of, when you're making work about things that we're currently failing to do or things that we think about in a way that isn't useful is never, um, never point at the audience, you know, never try and solve for the audience a problem that you have identified and you're claiming to have solved for yourself, you know, never point at anyone unless you've pointed at yourself first and actually use yourself as the example for, you know, I, I think about this in other shows where I talk more specifically about sort of ideas of privilege and things like that, that something that I've tried to do, and I'm not saying that I've in any way, it's an ongoing thing. You use your own failures as something to put down that other people can pick up and look at themselves in the light of rather than using the process of making a show to put yourself in a position where you arrive on the stage and you're just simply telling them how you solved their problem. You know, so that's the, to me, that's the key process to be able to effectively plant that seed that you talked about so beautifully, Namisha. Yeah. Then I'll tell you, what do you reckon, mate? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And, um, and, Oh, yeah, I, I think I'd, I'd just pick up um, again on what you were saying, Misha, about uh, discomfort and sitting with discomfort. I think that's that's absolutely one of the most um, one of the most valuable things that uh, theatre can do. And I think again that a lot of art can do, but but because theatre often happens, it is a public space so much, and to be able to do that in public to do that without shame to just to, for that to be allowed and for us to practice that is such a valuable thing because we're like so increasingly atomized and asked to kind of hold those things individually those things are seen as weakness like it, it, this the no i mean there is uncomfortability everywhere we're always in states of that and this is not something to um 
to to hide away from it's not something to to kind of like um do in private until you've solved it somehow is it so to actually kind of like um be upfront about that is is essential and um and I suppose the only thing I'll add to what you were saying Chris is like that notion of the door onto the real world is so important and that maybe it's also about making sure that that door is it's not necessarily the same door that you came in through as it were that there's a little bit there's a little bit more or a different perspective on the world to kind of take out with you as well so it's really about that kind of transformatory thing Thank you so much. Um, I've got one last question. We are very close to time, but um, I've been, been given permission just to squeeze in one last question. Um, so a, quest, a, con a conversation that we're also trying to have across Blood One and we're continuing Blood Two. We, um, we spoke to the Freedom Theatre from Palestine last, uh, the last event two weeks ago about this as well. And about how like with political theatre or theatre that wants to engage the audience in political thought and action, to put it like that, we also argue that it's not just about the content or, you know, as the water in the bucket, but also like how, as Chris, to use Chris's beautiful image, or like how the bucket is made, like how um, the, the actual political theater is made. Because if, you know, that the, the idea of theater, how we make theater, the process of making it during rehearsals, during the, 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 the field work, the research before rehearsals, etc., really, really matters. And I wondered whether, um, Tanuja, you had some thoughts on that and Chris and then Alicia finally. I mean, it's, 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 it's so important. And, and I think there can be no one way to do it. I mean, that is, that is where, as an artist, your, your purpose, your values, your ethics come into. And I think um, there is, again, I, I actually think that's something that in this country we don't, as, as theatre makers in this country, we don't talk enough about how those processes reflect our, our ethics and our values and and um because i think we're often kind of uh told to or like it, these things are often couched as if there are good ways to do things and bad ways to do things but actually it's about our own choices and responsibilities um and uh so maybe if maybe we'd feel like there was more political theatre more politically charged theatre as well if we were better at being kind of more public and um, more accountable to our own kind of ethics. Chris, have you got anything you'd like to add to that? Oh, I think that's any reflections. That's spot on. I'd, I'd say that it's you know it's it's quite often, and I'm aware that I'm speaking with the privilege of someone who's been doing this for like twenty odd years now. So I've obviously kind of. I've built up a certain immunity to, you know, difficult conversations, I suppose. But it's it's like, and a certain protection from them as well, which is, you know, you have to acknowledge. But the, both because of what I am and because of, you know, how long I've been doing what I do. But I think there's a real thing in what Tanuja's saying about, it being a constantly evolving process of being honest with yourself and taking on the input of other people about what, what the useful values to hold are and taking responsibility for working with organisations that share those as much as possible and not working with people who don't. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Um, and thank you for that. Um, Namisha, have you got anything that you'd like to add to that? Maybe there's actually, I, I think there are some parallels with also maybe your field of work as well in terms of the process, not just the end product. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, I, you know, I completely want to emphasize the point about sort of connecting with our own values and and um, and, and being really honest about, about the privilege that we have in it being able to shape those um, stories and methods and decide which are the issues that we sh shine a light on. And, and, I, and I think the how is so important because if we're really gonna live our values, then I think you have to, you have to privilege 
the the experiences and the voices of people who have lived experience of the issues that you're trying to raise awareness about you know you we we otherwise we're just reproducing privilege right we're just talking to each other telling each other you know how thoughtful and clever and you know interesting these ideas are but actually we're not the people often that have lived experience of the issues that we're really trying to um, shine a light on so I think I think it has to start with a really um, participa participatory process right from the word go who are we talking for who are we trying to you know talk about and who for we're not just talking to each other Absolutely. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, that is all we've got time for tonight. Uh, but I want to thank you, Tanuja, um, Nimisha and Chris for joining me um, and for such a <laughs> inspiring conversation. I really wish it could go on longer. Um, thank you, Chris, once again for the fantastic reading. We really, it was really amazing. Thank you. Um, and thanks to our partners, HowlRound, for hosting GLOD, and to our other partners, F-Side Cine Club, Romania's first feminist cine club devoted to promoting films made by women. I'd also like to thank the Royal Court Theatre in London and Sismo Stories and Performance in the Netherlands for supporting tonight's event. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us in solidarity tonight. Um, I'd like to remind you that if you you are able to make a donation to the charities um, Chris mentioned uh, before the break. Uh, you will be able to find the links in the HowlRound streaming and in social media. Um, and um, I'd, uh, ba, 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 ba. and basically to next the next event is on Monday the 22nd of Feb um, and we will be um, joined by Afghan writer, director and performer Monira Hashemi be sharing with us a montage of extracts from a series of her plays that she's done throughout her career, exploring gender and political violence in Afghanistan, including a play that she directed that she that was the first production ever in Afghanistan to be produced solely by uh, women. Uh, and everyone, you can sign up to our future events on, on our website. Um, so thank you again um, and um, see you next time. <laughs>